All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ninth Neurotech X webinar. Uh, my name is Sydney Swain Simon, and I'm one of the co founders of Neurotech X. If this is the first time hearing about our organization, we are an international community that facilitates the advancement of neurotechnology. We have a focus on open and accessible neurotechnology, and uh, our community has helped to innovate in the domain through a variety of different projects. We have had contact points with 11,000 people worldwide and done collectively over 150 events. We also have local chapters where you can meet others. Because we're such a large international network, the goal of these webinars is to give people from different countries and different disciplines the chance to learn about different neurotechnology subjects. Uh, we'll be doing these webinars on different themes, as well as showcase some of the amazing projects and research that our community does. We are always looking for feedback, so let us know if we can do a better job. Uh, with that in mind, we have two things you should know before we get started. Uh, number one, uh, please be respectful to those in chat. And number two, uh, if you have any questions, please post them in chat, uh, as I'll be monitoring it. If you do have a question, please just write question before typing it. Uh, the final thing before we begin is that if you're interested in hosting your own Neurotech X webinar, please send me a message on the Neurotech X Slack or email me at sydney at neurotechx.com. With that, uh, let's get started. So for this month, we are collaborating with the International Neuroethics Society uh, to bring you Helen Mayberg, uh, Dr. Helen Mayberg, who will be presenting Balancing Benefit and Risk in New Treatments for Depression. Deep Brain Stimulation, uh, or DBS, offers hope for people with severe chronic depression uh, and who do not respond uh, to conventional treatment. Although there has been much progress in the development of DBS, uh, there have been some setbacks and important considerations remain for those working in the field around the benefit-risk balance. Uh, research, therefore, must continue. Uh, Professor Helen Mayberg will talk about how DBS uh, got started and why, and the push for commercialization by industry. Uh, she will discuss the how the needs of the patient and the risk of no treatment options are balanced by the needs for care and design. We will also use, uh, we also discuss the use of new technologies in the treatment of DBS. Uh, so if you have never heard of uh, Dr. Helen Mayberg, uh, she was a pioneer in the world of DBS and use of, uh, in its use in uh, depression. Uh, she's a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, neuroscience, and uh, the Mount Sinai professor in neurotherapeutics at the Incan School of Medicine, uh, known for studies in brain circuits and depression and for pioneering deep brain stimulation research. Dr. Mayberg moved in 2018 from Emory University in Atlanta to Mount Sinai in New York as the founding director of the Center for Advanced uh, Circuit Therapeutics. Over her career in the United States and Canada, her teams have worked uh, to combine cutting edge... Um, oh, you're here in double. Oh, hopefully it's... Not a problem. Uh, maybe I'll just cut the audio. All right, tell me if you still have issues with the audio, uh, but uh, I'll continue for now. Uh, oh, so over a career in the United States and Canada, her team has worked to combine cutting edge imaging uh, strategies, quantitative behavioral metrics, and rigorous clinical trials to define brain-based biomarkers that will optimize treatment selection for individual patients with depression. Uh, extend, extending uh, this theme, uh, her new center at Mount Sinai will provide an integrated platform to catalyze collaborative translational research, uh, bringing to the, together clinicians from neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, and psychology, and experts from neuroscience, imaging, engineering, and computational modeling within a new, oh, sounds fine, good, perfect. And uh, with a unique shared ecosystem uh, and a common mission to advance precision uh, surgical treatments for patients with complex psychiatric disorders. Uh, Dr. Mayberg trained in neurology at Columbia's uh, Neurological Institute in New York, followed by a research fellowship in nuclear medicine, uh, medicine at John Hopkins. Uh, she is a member of the uh, National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of uh, Inventors, among other honors. Uh, and participates in a variety of scientific advisory activities across multiple fields in neuroscience. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mer uh, Mayberg. We're really excited to have you today. Thanks for having me, Sydney. Uh, so perhaps uh, just to, to get started, could you give us a brief history of uh, the field of DBS and its use in uh, depression? Well, I think it's important to move back initially to think about what DBS DBS is broadly, it's a neurosurgical procedure 
that really is a medical procedure that involves the placement of an electrode in the brain. It's called a neurostimulator. And that allows the controlled um, um, stimulation in a brain area with the implanted device. And so you can really think of it as a brain pacemaker. It's been, was introduced in the modern era in the late 80s um, when it was first done in France for Tremor. And it has been commercially available since 97 for the treatment of Tremor and Parkinson's disease. They're out. So it's, it's really a technology that has been entrenched in the treatment of severe movement disorder. Um, and its application in psychiatry actually also started um, in the late 90s um, in France by Bart Nutan, actually in Belgium by Bart Nutan, who um, did the first studies of DVS for obsessive compulsive disorder. And like Parkinson's, OCD utilized um, the technology of controlled brain stimulation through the pacemaker to effectively block abnormal activity, giving a controllable, reversible lesion, which had been done for OCD and in Parkinson's. So those early studies were substituting the stimulation for an ablation. And when we um, did our initial studies for depression, the logic was very different. We wanted to tune a circuit, as had been done in movement disorder and OCD, but the circuit wasn't defined by a past place that had been damaged. It was actually targeting a brain area that had been identified by imaging. So our initial studies back in 2003 were basically taking the logic and the technology developed for movement disorder, implemented in OCD, and applying it um, to, to patients with intractable depression to literally block an area that we wanted to turn down its activity by using image guidance placement and testing that hypothesis. And uh, is there a personal motivation for you to want to be working in this field? Well, not a personal motivation in that I myself don't have depression and is um, not part of um, my history. But I've always, I became interested in depression as a neurologist, seeing many neurological patients who seem to have depression as part of their neurological disorder, not as a reaction to their neurological deficit. And as I got into that as a resident and in my early days in imaging and partnering with psychiatrists and neurologists that were studying depression in stroke or in Parkinson's or in Huntington's, we started to map it. And so my interest was more, how does the brain go wrong in depression? How can we treat it like a neurological disorder and a symptom like not being able to move your arm or not being able to speak or having change in your vision? And can we literally use the technology of the times, which at that point in time was positron emission tomography, PET scans, and literally map what's wrong in patients who are depressed? And then that was really my impetus to think about what is the neurocircuitry of depression and what eventually led to trying to target those circuits in patients who really weren't responding to other treatments. And so um, from, for DBS as a technology, it's something that is primarily used for the uh, treatment of uh, TRD, so treatment-resistant depression, where uh, no other options are available. Um, what is the percentage of people that have TRD? So treatment-resistant depression, as it's defined, it's, 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 a, it's a loose term. Um, it really um, represents probably about 10% of patients who don't respond to conventional treatment. But to put that in context, a depressed patient who goes in for treatment of even a first major depressive episode, the numbers are that approximately 40% of patients will respond to the first treatment to which they're given. And with trial and error, those numbers go up 60, 70%. But for some, none own, some unknown reason, about 10% of people who have major depression develop a 
progressive problem where subsequent episodes stop responding to treatment. And that estimate is about 10% of those diagnosed with depression. And at that point, when medications stop working, our best available treatment continues to be electroconvulsive therapy. But even then, the likelihood that responding to ECT, if you respond, that you stay well long-term diminishes. And so um, the kind of patients that are eligible or have been studied in experimental um, trials of DBS have been those patients who generally have often previously responded to ECT and now have lost that capacity. So they are actually people with very, really no options except continued trial and error of medication or ECT. And, and we don't we really don't know really why, know why uh, what's, uh, the what's the cause of, cause of, 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 of TRD of, in the first place, right? It could be multiple factors that lead to it? Absolutely. I mean, quite frankly, we don't know the cause of many illnesses and depression is a syndrome. We know that it runs in families. We know that exposure as a young child to, tra to trauma can put you at high risk. We know that um, certain inflammatory disorders can bring it on. We know that certain neurological diseases and injuries can be part of it. But at the end of the day, we don't really know what causes depression. And, um, and, and thus, we, don't, we further don't know why a patient who's responded in the past Stop, um, begins to stop responding when they previously did. So the transition from a um, relapsing and remitting um, illness with episodes that you treat and that respond progress in some malignant way to a non-responsive state is, is a really important area that we need to figure out. And is there ever, ever any risk where TRD, or, or not DRD, but it's where DBS, where the patient essentially can adapt to, to the treatment? Have you found that that potentially is the case? Or uh, it, what is it about DBS where patients are able to have sustained uh, treatment with it? Well, this is what we're trying to figure out because what we've learned now you know, with the first cases starting in 2003, but with um, long-standing um, trials that we follow patients now, you know, more than 12, 13, 14 years with the implant, continuing to receive stimulation with patients generally staying um, well or certainly no longer in this treatment-resistant state, is that it's as though there's been a reset of an abnormal rhythm, and then people um, go about their lives with therapy and other um, ongoing treatments with the pacemaker in place. So what we're trying to figure out is, A, how do we pick patients that are appropriate for DBS? We've learned that precision of where we put the implant is critical and improvement in our technique has led to higher rates of response in these previously ECT resistant patients. But equally, we've learned that while we can see immediate effects in terms of very negative mood and this sort of um, paralysis that very sick people experience, that's really just the first step in a really long process of recovery where actually with the device in place, there's a systematic and over weeks to months improvement in behavior that's very much like what you see in patients that take um, conventional treatment or therapy. And what we're learning is with new technology is how to actually track the changes in the brain over time, virtually in real time by recording off the brain with new devices that'll give us signals off of the area we're stimulating to track how the brain state is evolving while we're watching a patient clinically recover. And to actually learn 
from the patient's brain what that process is because it really doesn't happen in a purely linear manner and it also doesn't happen immediately there are stages and in some ways it's very much like if you have a badly you know broken leg the first thing you need to do is realign the bone put it in a cast and let it heal and that seems to be what happens with the stimulator in place and once there's been a kind of change in the brain equilibrium how do you train someone to relearn how to reintegrate in their family in their personal life in the community you know what do you what does anyone do in rehabilitation and this is rehabilitation on top of ongoing stim so um since anxiety is a as a precursor for depression is this something that also helps in the management of that or is it separate in terms of a treatment so so in children anxiety can often be a precursor of depression and de anxiety can be a feature of a major depressive episode but it is not um the same and they actually don't necessarily go hand in hand it's um certainly possible to be depressed without prominent anxiety. And the reason I'm, I'm making that distinction is that as you watch the recovery process of the singular DBS that we do for depression, actually anxiety, if it's present, may diminish. But if people have a separate anxiety problem, actually it isn't touched even though their depression may be recovered. So we're learning that different symptom features of depression, the negative mood, the slowed thinking, the kind of disinterest, the lack of motivation, the suicidal thoughts, sleep and appetite, things tend to track together when people get well, but certain aspects of depression that may be, may actually live outside of depression actually aren't touched when you stimulate in this particular brain location. So learning about what part of depression is anxiety and what part is not is really important to understanding what clinical symptoms change and which don't. Right. And uh, for people who are in the chat, if you do have any questions for uh, Dr. Helen Maber, please post them at any time uh, as I'm monitoring it. Um, so. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about your lab at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, what was the motivation for bringing all these people together? Uh, it's quite a diverse set of skills that are going to be all within the same uh, ecosystem that is being created. Uh, what, why the profiles that you did find uh, and why maybe not people outside of that field? What's, what's your goal with this uh, 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 lab? You know, it's a little more simple-minded than I think it may sound. I mean, DBS is a well-established treatment for Parkinson's disease, and it can help with the disabling tremor and rigidity and difficulty with movement in patients who are no longer responding um, um, well to their medication where they have a lot of side effects. But even in Parkinson's, there are elements of Parkinson's that the DBS does not treat. And once the motor symptoms of Parkinson's are treated, other, other components of Parkinson's like mood, like compulsive behavior, like apathy, can emerge and become bigger problems than the motor symptoms, which now are um, effectively managed. And because we know that Parkinson's is a circuit disorder, but is not just a motor problem, it has behavioral elements called non-motor features of Parkinson's that are not tapped by DBS and that the medicines themselves also don't do a great job. So there's an opportunity using the same logic um, in Parkinson's and leveraging what we know about primary depression and circuits that we treat with depression. Same with OCD. OCD, Parkinson's, and depression all have similar elements, symptoms, if you might. They all affect 
movement, compulsions in OCD, thoughts, obsessions in OCD, and mood. And what we're trying to do in our new center is take advantage that the brain is composed of circuits and that OCD, depression, and Parkinson's as exemplars are already disorders where we utilize DDS. Why not bring everyone that works in these three disciplines together instead of just sharing a neurosurgeon, but living, working, and taking care and researching patients in silos? Let's actually work together because what we see in Parkinson's disease can be applied to the things we aren't yet doing fully in Parkinson's disease. So depression can inform Parkinson's, the movement features can inform depression and OCD, and we're doing it in, in one place where the scientists, the neurologists, the psychiatrists can all work together. So it's really doing what I think everybody knows we need to do. It's having an institution enable everyone being in the same place and actually thinking about these problems together. Makes total sense. Uh, so we do have a question from chat from uh, Uma Mohan. Uh, uh, they're curious uh, to know, uh, for depression, how well ca characterized are the neural patterns that would indicate a patient is recovering? So what we've done is we've studied it a few ways. We've published on tracking when patients are getting better on the, the subcolossal singular DBS over time. How does the PET pattern, how does the metabolic and blood flow pattern change? And what we see is that locally, the activity is downregulated. So blood flow and metabolism are reduced, which was actually our putative logic for going into that target. That seems to be an area very important to negative mood. And we sort of conceptualize these patients as being stuck in a state. So we're down-regulating activity in this area 25, the subcolossal cingulate. And areas that are connected to it also show decreased activity. But in turn, with, and that pattern is seen very early, but what tracks over months is that you actually get upregulation, increases in metabolism and blood flow in areas in the frontal cortex, areas that are not directly receiving the DDS, but are connected to the areas that are. So it's almost a two-phase change, decrease activity in the areas you stimulate and actually increase activity in other areas throughout the brain. Now, what we've added to this story is to track with these new devices where we can measure what are called the local field potential, the local oscillation, the brain activity, like a invasive EEG scan, the activity right at where we're stimulating. And we're starting to see is there's a much more complex pattern of change even in that location. And what is happening immediately when you stim is different from what happens over time. And long-winded answer to the um, appreciated question is that that actually is the focus of our ongoing grants, to take advantage of new technology that allows you to measure right off the device all the time with the patient pretty much 24 seven or bringing them to the lab or recording at home and actually follow what's happening as they are recovering. And it turns out it isn't just um, a change in a theta band or an alpha band or a beta band. It turns out to be a combination of signals and we're not yet at the point to know exactly what we are um, confident is a sine qua non signal of recovery. But as we study these patients, and learn about that recovery trajectory, that will give us a signal that will allow us to tune, perhaps even have a closed loop system that we can make adjustments to the device to pretty much dial in this particular pattern that seems to be essential to recovery. And that's really the focus of our ongoing work. 
So uh, let's dive into uh, the ethics of, of the BS. Um, obviously, it's a t a t an approach that not everyone's going to really benefit from. Uh, you do have to consider the risks associated with doing any form of invasive procedure. And, and I remember when we were doing our test stream, you know, you had some very, very uh, big opinions around uh, this this topic. So I was wondering if you can kind of share some of your own uh, thoughts uh, when it comes to, to the subject. Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, I'm a doctor and the goal is in any kind of research involving patients is first and foremost, we want, to keep patient, we want patients to get well, but we need to be humble, careful, and ethical in terms of keeping them safe. And that we have to always very systematically ensure that um, we keep that in mind because patients in this situation are incredibly vulnerable to be ill, to be in pain, to basically not be able to do what you want to do and to be suffering and feeling guilty and perhaps even wanting to hurt yourself, to be offered a possibility to do something experimental that's invasive, it needs to be framed very carefully that it is an experiment and we need to actually see if it works and it actually may not, even though a patient is certainly hoping it does. And really framing expectation with something that new is very, very important. And as you in, involve patients in this kind of experiment, in this kind of experimental treatment, you, you need to have a relationship that ensures that there is bi-directional dialogue so that a patient is treated both as a patient, but they are a research subject which means there needs to be a bi-directional dialogue. Patients are a collaborator that are gonna help us to know how to proceed when we're doing something helpful, when we're not, but we need quantitation and metrics to know. And that, um, and that in starting this, you know, it's now you know, more you know, 15 years in, that at the beginning where we had no idea if our idea was correct we actually didn't know if we might not make someone worse, that that has to be properly framed. And we need to watch patients very carefully. And if you're dealing with something that is invasive and DBS is making a small opening in your skull and placing something in your brain, it's never good to go in someone's brain if you don't have to. So if you have any other option, you should take it. Patients need to exhaust all of the available treatments, including ECT, because one wants to weigh the relative risk and benefit of, of a treatment and maximize the likelihood of getting well and to have a stepwise way that you take on increased risk. So we, this is why we started with patients who really had exhausted and tried every available option. Those are the only patients that you should expose this kind of risk, even um, because you don't know if it will work. And now that we have evidence that we can effectively get certain patients better, if not well, and that effect can be sustained long-term, that we understand that there don't seem to be accumulated side effects or side effects or problems that develop over time, there still can be hardware malfunction, things can break, they have to be replaced. We know that if you if if the hardware um, becomes broken or the battery dies, that we can replace it and you can recapture the effect. Then we start to ask different questions. We start to ask, maybe we shouldn't wait till someone has been sick so long that everything about their life has been lost. And we start to think about how to do this earlier. That's a different question that we're just starting to address that requires us to use technology, whether it's imaging or other biomarkers, to know what is the right group of patients in that this particular treatment might be appropriate. And instead of waiting until you've exhausted everything else to actually know that this is the treatment for you earlier on. So to me, you know, the ethics 
of any kind of intervention with technology is to know the technological risk, but more to make sure that patients, subjects understand what is known and what is unknown and be in a position to weigh their options um, appropriately. But that all treatments, invasive and not invasive, have a benefit risk ratio. And we have to understand those or explore them and communicate with people that might want to take on something, whether it's experimental or just a invasive procedure that's become part of our mainstream. Right. Uh, so I have two more questions from chat. One from uh, Dan Pajek. Uh, he asks, uh, how do you see the patient uh, workup evolving as these treatments become available? Uh, do you think neuroimaging will become standard for all NDD patients? Is this already standard in some centers? Well, I think that our big goal, as is the goal of precision medicine outside of psychiatry, is we want to match patients to the treatment that is optimal to them. You know, when you have an infection, um, it's easy to know if you have pneumonia or not. It's not easy to know what kind of pneumonia and to treat with the appropriate um, medication. You know, you can say, well, I can give everybody penicillin because it's a pneumonia. And penicillin probably won't hurt you unless you're allergic, but it actually in an essence will hurt you if you actually have tuberculosis as the origin of your pneumonia because it won't treat it at all. So I think that imaging is one avenue if we continue to um, collect data that does suggest that brain circuits and brain states are different in patients who respond to different kinds of treatment then if we can show which kind of brain imaging is most reliable, most robust, most cost-effective, and most available, then a brain state test might really be the way to go. I mean, it's like taking a sample of a tumor. You take the tumor, you run um, receptor subtypes, and you treat by receptor type. And I'd like to think that we aspire to do that. And my lab's work has been looking at this strategy, whether it's to choose psychotherapy or drug, or now ECT or DBS, I think that is a logical um, transition. But I think it's not ready for prime time. We have evidence that PET scanning can be good to make a prediction about drug or therapy, but so does fMRI. And the next step is when patterns have been identified to actually test them prospectively. At this point in time, our best decisions about the best patients for DBS kind of revolve around looking at which of these patients that are ECT failures, is there a clinical phenotype? Is there something in the data that we've already derived that can help us to refine our inclusion criteria. And at the present time for the subcolossal singular DBS, our best evidence is that the patients that do well are those that have a more classic melancholic depression. They have intense negative mood, psychic pain, and they have this slow, almost virtual paralysis. It's a classic syndrome, it generally response to ECT, but these are people that may have previously responded and no longer do. So actually quantifying or having a biomarker of that phenotype that the physicians on the team are very, very good at identifying, but that doesn't actually have a test, a rating scale, a imaging type yet is really what our current challenge is. But I envision a future where Actually, some combination of exam as well as brain phenotyping in the setting of this kind of history will actually classify patients and allow you to take a treatment selection algorithm approach. And I think if we approach our experiments with that goal in mind, we can 
kind of get rid of that idea, or we can actually work to have the data help to move us to that next step. And, um, and that's kind of where we are now. Another question from chat, uh, from uh, Eamon Egan. Um, I'm not sure if you can maybe clarify what he's asking, but uh, he writes, uh, is DBS only used for unipolar or uh, bipolar? Sure, very good question. So depression can be classified in different ways. The two main categories are unipolar, which means that's called a major depressive um, disorder, which means you tend to have episodes where you only have depression, whereas bipolar disorder is a disorder where actually you can be in different states, one where you have a depression, but also where you transition, where you have overactivity, elevated mood, more risky behavior. Um, and so you, you can have an overactive state and an underactive state. They get treated, they run in families in very different ways. Their biology is considered to be distinct. The depressed state of bipolar, if you treat it with a classic antidepressant, can in many patients flip them into the manic state. So they don't respond to treatment the same. And we use mood stabilizers for bipolar disorder, but they can be equally disabling. And many bipolar patients over time kind of get stuck in the depressed state. And so in essence, they look like unipolar patients. At Emory, in our first experiments that we published back in 2012, we wanted to address this issue of could DBS be used for the bipolar type depressives, as well as the more classical major depression or unipolar type depressives, because we wanted to know if it worked for depression, what would it do for the bipolar patients who were also depressed? And we took a intermediate step. We, we enrolled patients that had bipolar type two, which is a subgroup of bipolar patients that don't get full-blown manias. They get what are called hypomanias, but they do have, have more ups and downs. And we had a group of those patients that were also stuck depressed. And they actually responded to the subcolossal cingulate DBS like the unipolars did. Even the ones that didn't respond, even at higher doses, we didn't flip them ever into mania. So there's something about this target in the brain that does seem to impact the depression side of things. In other targets that are being studied with DBS in the medial forebrain bundle, in the ventral striatum, a side effect of stimulation is you can make a unipolar patient actually have wildly elevated mood, in fact, push them into a mania even when they haven't had it. So understanding the circuit, the biology, that different systems respond in different ways may be critical for knowing which groups of patients would be suitable. So again, a long answer but that we've done and tested the safety and efficacy of the um, singular DBS in the bipolar two patients. They respond the same. No one has done patients who have full-blown bipolar one disorder. And so um, that that is, um, we don't know yet. Well, thank you so thank much, you so much. For, uh, for, uh, for your questions. Your questions. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that in a second here. Second but I wanted to jump to another subject. Another subject. Um, so we, uh, were, we were, uh, one of the things that we were wanting to cover was the uh, commercialization of this technology and, and, the, and where industry plays a role in all of this. Uh, obviously, you know, there's, you know, benefits and disadvantages when it comes to, uh, trying to create something more commercial as a product. Uh, perhaps a disadvantage is, you know, you may have groups of people trying to lobby for this particular thing and may try to overreach where it will or will not be used. But where uh, the benefits may be is that you'll have uh, an organization that can support this technology and help it to grow and innovate uh, with it. Uh, could you maybe share some of your own thoughts around commercialization? So, you know, at the end of the day, particularly for your audience, which is, you know, open access, tech savvy, looking to push the envelope, 
all of that is good. But when one has to remember is when you're thinking about a device, something that is implanted in a person, that safety is paramount. And even if one's intention is noble and um, and and oriented toward doing good, that stuff goes wrong and people need to be taken care of. And you don't always know what is on the other side. You know, you, you can plan something, but not know. When things are commercialized, one has to actually deal with the real world. Someone has to have quality assurance. You need to make sure that things are built to specs. You need to have testing so that you're sure they do what they say, because error may be harmful and um, lethal in anything that one might put in the brain or in the body. So that commercialization is important and having partners in that as academia or scientists, whether they're in formal settings or informal settings, how do we safely test new ideas? We need to have proper informed consent. We need to have some form of regulation so we are sure that people are not exploited and we all play by the same rules, but that we are able to actually see that when something is working, that there's a pipeline that can make it accessible to the people that need it. And unfortunately, these kinds of things require, because of their safety concern and their specialization in the engineering, who's going to build it, who's going to ramp it up. There's 100,000 people who have DBS for movement disorder, you know, over the last 30 years. It's not the, it's not like um, penicillin. But on the other hand, how do we move from an idea, a prototype, a testing, to imagine that if it actually can do good, you have to have commercial partners. And you have to have commercial partners that are not, maybe they'll still be there by the time we get something commercialized. Because once you implant someone and someone is getting benefit and someone goes out of business or someone moves on from a startup or it just doesn't work out, you have to consider, are you going to remove the device? Who's going to manage that device? Who's going to be there when a battery needs to be replaced? A system breaks. One needs the backup as well as the, the local who is managing someone, you know, patient to doctor or patient to technology. And you don't tend to think about these things because usually a great idea starts out well and then you find the flaws and it, it kind of moves by the wayside. So I think we need to figure out ways in which ideas have capacity to grow and get figured out. But we're also thinking that if it's going to have benefit for patients that we actually are partnering in ways with um, technology companies or with um, device companies that actually have a track record of how to do this safely and provide service and backup and support in the long term. And, and that's a bi-directional um, process. You know, we have to know companies need to invest and commercialize and and have shareholders and have a bottom line. But if they're in the business of healthcare, their job is to get people things that help them and to do that in a safe and effective way. So perhaps not necessarily everyone will be able to create a company in uh, in DBS simply because of the cost associated with it, the, the, the connections that would be required. Uh, to be able to execute. So it's something that maybe people should consider prior to, to going into uh, an entrepreneurship idea in uh, well, if they want to I go into this domain. I think that's true, but I think that the what what's happened is, you know, one company um, was the only the only game in town, so to speak. And so innovation was relatively limited for more than 20 years. I mean, the devices implanted up until the last few years were basically the devices that were developed, you know, 
you know, at the beginning. And so competition and the progress in neuroscience is creating a, um, a space to figure out what do we want. If you have a circuit and you want to tune it, how do you want to tune it? What kind of flexibility do you want? Do you want a readout? Do you want it on all the time? Do you want control by the patient? Do you want it to come on and know when it needs to be on and then turn itself off? Do you want to be able to direct the current to different circuits for different needs? You That needs innovation. That needs new devices. It's not to throw out the old, it's to innovate on top of the old. And that's where I think startups, innovation, scientific pursuits live. And the Brain Initiative um, at NIH really saw this and has enabled building of new tools, including how to build and collaborate with available devices, build new devices, and test them in safe environments to see what kind of prototype technologies might really help us. We need readouts. We need um, ways in which to deliver current in different ways to different places. And so I think there is a space where startups, entrepreneurs, scientists with, you know, in academia can be partnering to learn about the brain and imagine what is the technology of the future that we want and then figure out how to build it. But we need to be seeing it not just in niche markets, but to study disorders so that these technologies have more than one use case. No one's ever going to be behind building and putting the R&D in if it actually is too small a group of people. So we need to think broadly about how technology can impact circuits in different disorders in different ways. So uh, the other subject that we wanted to cover today was the, the future of this field and new uh, treatment options that might uh, be created in the upcoming years for, for TRD and other forms of mental illness. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, maybe some of the work that your organization has done, and uh, where do you see this future going? So I think, you know, since we're dreaming here together, you know, with, with everybody listening, what do we really want? We want to understand how the brain works. We want to understand these circuits and whether it's macro circuits that we're impacting now, people are studying cell specific circuits so that we know what particular cell type might be driving the cells that we stimulate in, in mass in this area 25 region and the regions that are connected to it. But that once we define and see that people can get better with this invasive, somewhat crude way of treating these profoundly ill patients and watching them recover, to now kind of go, what did we do? And reverse engineer it. And if we can understand what exactly is changing in the brain, look to how we can do that, repair the brain, tune the brain in a way that doesn't require the invasive device. And I think that, A, you don't want too many variables changing at the same time. Right now, it's like, look, if I didn't have to put an electrode in these people's brain and I could do it with transcranial magnetic stimulation, of course I would. The problem is, is these people don't respond to TMS. Been there, done that, wish it worked, doesn't. So. How do we take the invasive tool, learn as much as possible, and then learn to build a tool that you could do without invading the brain? And people are thinking about how do you get, how do you actually pinpoint current through the skull, electrical current? People are trying this. The question is how to guide it, how to steer it. People are trying to think about focus ultrasound. It is used at some frequencies to make a lesion, and that is going quite well. Can you also use it to tune a circuit? Can we take things we've learned from um, animal studies where you can do cell-specific driving of activity in cells, but do it safely? You still have to get it into the brain, but I think that as neuroscience evolves, as technology evolves, 
as you have use cases. Engineers like solving problems. If the question is, what can I build that can safely deliver current deep in the brain without actually having to invade the brain? We're going to watch the evolution of technology move into the space we need it to be. I think that as we limit the variables that we have to test, then I think we're going to watch technology innovations come online because we can identify use cases where we can where we can um, utilize new technology safely. And so uh, finding more or less invasive procedures uh, is one potential direction. Um, uh, for example, I don't know if, if something more like a stentro design would be something that would work with, with depression or is it not the appropriate uh, approach? I think that, you know, thinking about stem cells, thinking about viral vectors, thinking about... Oh, no, I said stentrode. The, oh, I'm sorry. The, the stentrode, so sim similar to the technology that I think uh, Elon is working on with, uh, with Neuralink, uh, something that would pass through the, the blood vessels. Uh, oh, okay. So, so I think that, again, if you can come through the blood vessels, you still need to drive it to a place. So if one sees that delivery and bypassing the blood-brain barrier by going more directly to the brain, so kind of focused chemical delivery systems. I think that's a, a testable hypothesis, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that evolves. You're still going to need to have safety issues to drive things into the brain, but that's done now for um, clot-busting drugs and um, um, interventional um, radiologists or radiologists can do amazingly Herculean things in the brain in small vessels that one never would have thought anyone could ever directly impact. So I think that technology evolves and the question will be, what do we want to have happen? Is it going to be that there will be drug designs that just getting them close to the brain through the vessels is the way to go? Are we going to um, deliver current through blood vessels rather than through an electrode implanted into the brain directly. I'd like to think that maybe one day we can send Trojan horses in some ways that are marked to go to very specific places and deliver them through blood vessels so you wouldn't have to deliver them through the brain at any time directly. But I think that we need to know where we want something to go and how we want to affect the brain, and then our delivery system will evolve to be as safe and as non-invasive as need be. That if we just build a delivery system without not knowing what we want to have happen, I think we're going to get a disconnect. But I think this is where the future is going. As there are, you know, modest wins, if you will, by something like DBS or using the big wins like in movement disorder. How do we translate that to a non-invasive platform and utilize these new kind of techniques? And I think that's where the future is going. Uh, so we'll do a couple more questions as we're uh, close to uh, ending our session. Uh, we do have one from chat uh, from uh, Furkan uh, Afzal. Um, so he has questions more around uh, depression. Um, so how do you answer the question if someone asks, do depressive episodes cause change in brain activity, let's say SCC, or does brain activity change lead to depression? Well, you know, that's uh, uh, the ultimate kind of philosophical basis of the whole field. You know, um, depression starts somewhere. And um, as a neurologist, the conceptualization is a brain state causes the behavior. And so I'm certainly of the school of what sets the brain state off is the unanswerable question. But when the brain is in a certain state, the output, the expression of the behavior is depression. And what we don't know is that when we see that overactivity in the subcolossal cingulate in area 25 is associated with a high negative mood, 
and is seen in these severe depressed patients in combination with shutdown of parts of the frontal cortex. That state correlates with depression. What we don't know is if you just increase activity in area 25 without a provocation, does that produce a sensation of depression? And if you kept it in that state, does that evolve to look like a major depressive episode? That would be the ultimate causal experiment. In animals, you can create an animal that is feeling reward by driving the dopamine system and having an animal stimulated in a way that is rewarding. And when you increase the excitability of the rodent equivalent of area 25, it will basically stop the animal from experiencing reward. It becomes anhedonic. And that is one causal model that overactivity or changes in the, the electrical tone of area 25 seems to produce this negative state. And that is something to continue to track down. The question is, is what is causing area 25 and the regions it's communicating with in this circuit to go wrong? It's normal to have this circuit come online when you are confronted with something that is negative, something that is not in your best interest, something that makes you sad and to move away. You expect that system to come online, do its thing, and once the stimulus and the response and action has passed, for that system to turn off. In depression, people seem to have this ongoing signal without an off switch. It has no context. Nothing someone can do can make it stop. So the system is stuck. And the question is, is what is the situation that causes it to be stuck? So again, it isn't like depression lives outside you. Depression is a state that is produced in response to a stimulus. And when the brain makes this configural maneuver and brain areas talk to each other and give you this negative signal, it causes you to act. But when it fails to turn off, it produces this chronic state that we identify as the wrong response. And so it's a syndrome and it certainly impacts how people behave and how they live. And uh, perhaps the, the final question then. Um, so I, I don't know if you'd like to maybe talk a little bit about the future of the Center for Advanced uh, Circuit Therapeutics and, and what direction you're going. I know that the, organi the, uh, the Institute in itself is relatively new, so perhaps you can kind of give people a quick, uh, 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 a quick explanation of it and where it's going for the future. So, you know, what we're trying to do is basically do um, um, kind of focused neuroscience experiments to inform what are circuits that control and um, go wrong in Parkinson's patients in OCD and depression or other disorders in order to understand how the brain works, how to design stimulation-induced treatments that address symptoms that aren't currently being treated. We're trying to combine, you know, how to study Parkinson's patients who have apathy or have compulsive behavior or have depression. And by scanning them, studying them, understanding that when we stimulate for their motor problems, why do sometimes we stimulate in a place when we make them more compulsive or we make them apathetic? How to use those almost accidents of the treatment in a systematic way to understand the circuits we're in and the circuits that we want to be in and the circuits that we don't want to be in. So the idea is how to use evolving technology, whether it's commercial or non-commercial, to do better by patients who have exhausted their opportunities, but who have reached the point where brain stimulation is the next step. And to develop and enrich the treatments that we do now and to involve patients in opportunities to actually learn and have other problems that they have treated as well. 
it'll also inform a platform that when our colleagues on campus have ideas in addiction or in eating disorders or in schizophrenia, that as other colleagues are developing circuit-based models and have ideas that um, stimulating or blocking or changing activity in particular areas works in animals or there's evidence from imaging studies that will be in a position to set up controlled experiments to test out ideas that are evidence-based so that we have a true bi-directional platform to go from clinical ideas to the surgical theater, as we did in Toronto when we tried out our first ideas of why to stimulate Area 25 and block it for depression, that I think that we're trying to create a platform where innovative ideas in well-researched groups of patients who have problems that aren't being addressed can be investigated and we can work to develop novel treatments for them as well. And uh, final, final question, if people would like to keep uh, up to date with your research, what's the best way of uh, doing so? Well, you know, I'm of the school of, we talk about our published papers and, and hopefully as, you know, um, new, um, new findings are published that people can always follow us by in the publication space. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm learning about um, social media. I'm not um, big with it. So thank you for this opportunity. But I think that, you know, as one looks at our website, sees the list of collaborators, um, um, we have people here like Kisung Choi who worked out the pathways that we target for stimulation. Allison Waters is one of our scientists that works on cortical signaling so that we can actually have a fingerprint on the cortical signal to know we're in the right place or the wrong place. Martin Figui, a psychiatrist who really is our lead in thinking about OCD. Brian Capel, who's a neurosurgeon. They all have a presence. They're all doing both clinical work and research work. And I think people can kind of follow along, you know, this kind of work is a marathon and not a sprint. And I think it's always wonderful to have an opportunity to kind of kind of riff a little bit about what we're doing and what we're thinking about. It's, it's quite self-indulgent, but these are about setting up rigorous experiments, one experiment at a time, testing it and knowing when your idea is right or wrong and then building on top of it. So stay tuned, you know, we're, we're getting started and I think you'll be seeing the work of my team and the people that come to work with us over the, over the ensuing years. And my team at, at Emory with Patricio Ribaposé and Bob Gross and Andrea Crowell continue to manage and, and make progress um, with us. So we remain um, a, a, big, a big team trying to understand particularly our depression work. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mayberg, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking some time in your busy schedule. Uh, and I know that the chat also appreciates it quite a lot as well. And also thank you to the International Neuroethics Society for helping to put this together. Uh, we do appreciate your collaboration in this venture. And uh, thank you for everyone for joining us. If you are, if you did like this uh, stream and you would like to su be subscribed to be informed uh, for future videos, uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, if you'd like to get a monthly dose of what's happening in the neurotech field, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, the link can be found in the video description below. Uh, with that, we hope you have a good day and we'll see you next time. Thank you for the time. Bye-bye.